Father, how thankful we are for your spirit that floods over us, Lord, like torrents of living water, saving us, sanctifying us, and Lord, now teaching us, teaching us, Lord, about you, that, Lord, we would become more like you. So, Lord, continue, we pray, to enable us, empower us by your spirit to worship you through the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's saints say, amen, amen. amen. Please be seated. Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 3, shall we? Acts chapter 3. Uh, last time we were together in chapter 2, we looked at several things regarding the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've looked at the birth of the church at the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we looked at the sermon by Peter through the control of the Holy Spirit. And we also saw those who believed by the conviction of of the Holy Spirit. Now as we come to chapter 3, we're going to look at the, the healing of a lame man through the power of God's Holy Spirit. So let's pick up our reading in verse 1 of Acts chapter 3, uh, reading down through verse 11. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was, heal, uh, who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed." Now here in Acts chapter 3, we of course have a very familiar miracle, the healing of the man who was lame. A great work of God's Holy Spirit as we have that first miracle of healing, if you will, uh, listed for us by Luke here in Acts chapter 3. Now the, this miracle that Luke records does many things, there's no doubt three of which we want to look at today. So if you're outlining or taking notes, uh, we're going to look at three things that this miracle does. Number one, the first thing this miracle does, it substantiates Peter's teaching. It substantiates Peter's teaching. You see, it's no coincidence that this miracle came on the heels of Peter's first sermon because Peter had been preaching that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. And this miracle confirms, substantiates his teaching. In fact, turn, if you would, back to Hebrews chapter 2 for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 2. Because, you know, there's a lot of people today who say, well, if I can just see a miracle. Or, how do you know what the disciples were saying were true? Well, the reason we know what Peter was teaching is, in fact, correct. It's because it was confirmed through the wonders, signs, and miracles that the apostles performed. Uh, take a look at verse 1, Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse 1. It says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Speaking of the teaching of the apostles, we would say, for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and in fact it was, and every uh, transgression and disobedience received a just reward, 
and it did, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, the words of Jesus proclaiming the gospel message, and was confirmed to us through those who heard him, speaking of the teaching of the apostles. So what Peter was teaching and what the apostles were teaching regarding Jesus Christ being the Messiah, the anointed one of God is in fact true. How do we know that? Look at verse four. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So the signs of the, of the miraculous wonders that were being manifest in the life of the disciples validated, confirmed, substantiated the teaching of the gospel message. Uh, back to Acts chapter three. The first point is very simple, I know, but it's an important point to be sure as God bears witness to the teaching of Peter. How? Through the signs, wonders, and miracles. So the first thing this miracle does, it substantiates Peter's teaching. Number two, the second thing this miracle does is it sets an example for us today. It sets an example for us today. Uh, that's in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And there are five things we want to look at as it pertains to this example that these men are setting for us. Because the truth of the matter is the book of Acts sets forth many examples regarding a variety of things. In the book of Acts, we see different examples about prayer, about church government, about what we should do, what we should not do, and why we do the things we do. So a lot of great examples are given. But here we have the example of Peter and John. Peter and John. And as we said, there are five things we want to look at regarding the example of these men. Number one, the first thing I learn about these men is they were men of prayer. They were men of prayer. Look at verses one through three. In Acts chapter three, verse one, it says, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Now, we often see Peter and John together as we were going through the Gospels. Peter, John, and his brother James were the, uh, the inner circle, if you will, of Jesus' ministry on various occasions. In Luke 5.10, they had a fishing business together. Uh, in Matthew 17.1, they were on the Mount of Transfiguration together. In Luke 22.8, they prepared the Passover meal together. In Mark 5.37, they were at Jairus' house together. And here, we see they're going to pray together at the hour of prayer. It says it was the ninth hour. That would be three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the Jews typically prayed three times a day. Once was at the third hour, 9 a.m., the sixth hour, 12 p.m., and then the uh, ninth hour or three o'clock in the afternoon. And the reason they do that is from Psalm 55 when David said, in the evening and the morning and at noon, I will pray to you. So three times a day. And here we see a great example of prayer. In fact, drop back to Acts chapter two, look at verse 42. Uh, Acts chapter two, look at verse 42. It says, and they, the apostles, James and John included, continued repetitively, steadfastly, not only in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread, but in prayers. These guys were continually, steadfastly men of prayer. I drop down to verse 46, Acts chapter 2, verse 46. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46, it says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Now, according to chapter 3, verse 1, the reason they were going to the temple is to pray. Good, three of you were awake, of course. They came to pray. In verse 46 of Acts 2, it says they continued daily in the temple. And here we see that beautiful example of men of prayer. And what a great example that sets for us. And oh, how we ought to be men and women of prayer. Now, I realize that all of us have a lot going on, and sometimes we don't find a lot of time to pray. 
Or our life's so upside down, that's all we're doing is praying all the time. God help me, God help me, God help you, follow me? Okay, three of us understand that. The rest of you cheer up, you will eventually. But the truth of the matter is this whole idea of continually, repetitively being in prayer carries the idea of a lifestyle of prayer. It's realizing that God is always there. It's having that ever awareness of God's presence in our lives. That's why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, we're to pray without ceasing. Ephesians 6, 18 says to pray always. And what a great example they set. Now, as they were going to prayer, look at verse 2. It says, a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the temple, uh, at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. Now, when it talks about going into the temple, it doesn't mean the temple building itself. It speaks of the temple courtyard. There's two different words for temple that are used. One word is for the temple building itself, the structure. That's not the word that's used here. This particular word for temple carries the idea of the temple mount area where people were gathering, not necessarily to go into the temple itself. That, of course, was reserved for the priests. But people would come to the temple to pray as Peter and John were doing, but they also came to give alms. Now, this particular fellow was laid daily at the gate called Beautiful. Now, the Beautiful Gate is on the eastern side of the Temple Mount near the Valley of the Kidron or the King's Valley or the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, this gate, the Gate Beautiful, is also called the Eastern Gate. It's called the Golden Gate, the Shushan Gate. These are all good names for this gate throughout the periods of history. It's a very magnificent gate according to Josephus. Uh, Josephus tells us it was made out of Corinthian brass and it was magnificent to look at his words. Now the gate we see today is of course walled up. That gate is a much later gate from the gate from Jesus' time. Uh, the gate we see today called the Gate Beautiful or the Golden Gate or the Eastern Gate is a relatively new gate. It was uh, built during the Ottoman Empire by Suleiman the Magnificent in 1538 AD. So it's a relatively new wall. And yet when we go to Israel, we of course walk by it and we see it. It's, it's bricked up today, by the way. You cannot enter uh, the Golden Gate because um, the Muslims believe that the Messiah will come through that Eastern Gate and he in fact will. You say, wait a minute, Clark, they don't believe in the Messiah. That's true, but they bricked it up just in case. <laughs> they also put a Muslim cemetery in front of it, knowing that no Kohen, the, the priest, would walk through a cemetery. So they kind of covered their bases on two points, just in case the Messiah is real. Now, that's the gate where he was laying at today. And the reason this becomes so significant is because this particular gate was by what we call the court of the treasury. Near the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women is the court of the treasury. There, Josephus tells us, they had seven trumpet-shaped brass collectors where people would come onto the Temple Mount and give their alms, their gifts, their tithes and their offerings. And this would be a perfect place to beg for money because of the people wanting to come and show their great piety and their great generosity to God in their giving. They, of course, would give some to the poor and some to God and so everybody can see how wonderful and spiritual they really are. And that is where this occurred. Now, let's come to a second thing we want to look about these men. Number one, they were men of prayer. Uh, number two, they were men of compassion. They were men of compassion. Look at verse 4 in Acts chapter 3. It says, And fixing his eyes on him with, Peter, uh, with John, Peter said, Look at us. Now I think we see the compassion of these men here. They were on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer to pray. 
And Peter stops and focuses on this man who is destitute. Focuses on this man who is lame and can't walk from his mother's womb. And that's really a beautiful picture of compassion. Now it is interesting, back in Acts chapter 2 verse 46, it says they continued daily with one accord in the temple. So Peter and John were daily at the temple. Back in verse 2 of Acts chapter 3, we're told this lame man was daily at the temple. Peter and John, no doubt, passed by this man every single day, presumably three times a day as they went to the three hours of prayer. Every single day, continually, they passed by this man. And yet today, today, they stop. And they turn, and Peter said in verse 4, look at us. You say, Clark, why today? Why now? Why him? Well, that's a good question. I have to believe it's because at this point in Peter and John's life, they're now filled with the Holy Spirit previously, prior to Acts chapter 2, they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. They were simply going to the hour of prayer out of religious observance, thinking it's something they had to do. But now they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And now their hearts are touched and transformed in such a way that now they're moved with compassion when they see the need of others. And I think that becomes very significant for us for a couple of reasons. Because oftentimes we too are moved with compassion. But the question is, why are we moved with compassion? Are we moved with compassion towards someone who has need because we think it's just simply the right thing to do? Or we're doing it out of religious observance? Or are we doing it to be seen of men, to get that attaboy, that pat on the back, good job, keep up the good work kind of accolade? Or is the Holy Spirit working in our hearts and in our lives that we're at a point where we just have to turn and help that person? Is it a Get to or a got to, you follow me? Because if we're trying to exhibit compassion, if we're being moved with compassion out of religious observance or some kind of duty, we're doing it in the flesh. And whenever we're trying to become compassionate in the flesh, we'll always falter, fatigue, and fail. But when we're exhibiting compassion by God's Holy Spirit, now it's something we really want to do, not something we think we have to do. And I think that's very significant for us for a couple of reasons as it pertains to being moved with compassion. Why? Because number one, I think it's important for us to understand that we can't help everyone. I mean, we just simply can't help everyone. There's not enough hours in the day. There's not enough resources at our disposal. Now, if our hearts are moved by God's Holy Spirit to, to have compassion on somebody and to help somebody, right on. Praise the Lord. But when the next person comes along and we can't help them because of time restraints or uh, resource uh, restraints, we can't beat ourselves up over it. We got to just remember that, well, you know, Jesus said, the poor you will have with you always. There's always going to be someone that's in need, and we're not going to be able to help everybody. So we need to be careful not to beat ourselves up when we don't. But I think the second thing we need to understand is not only we can't help everybody, but we shouldn't help everybody. You say, whoa, wait a minute, time out, Clark. What do you mean we shouldn't help everybody? I mean, shouldn't we follow the example of Peter and John and the example of Jesus in the Gospels? Shouldn't we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, house the homeless? Shouldn't we be moved with compassion like Jesus often we find in the Gospel accounts? Yes. However, there could come a point in time where we're no longer helping somebody, we are enabling somebody. There's a big difference. 
You say, well, Clark, where's that line where we're no longer helping, but we're hurting? We're actually enabling. I don't know. It's a line that each of us have to determine on an individual basis. Mom, dad, you understand what we're talking about? Sometimes we're really not helping our kids, are we? We're enabling them to continue down the path they're on. So we need to be very careful, not only in our family relationships, but in our personal relationships. As much as our heart breaks to help somebody, as we're moved with compassion, we need to take that step back and ask ourselves, are we really helping them or are we enabling them? Are we hurting them? Because if we're enabling them, we're not helping them. We're actually hurting them because it's allowing them to continue on the path they're already on. But I think there's a third thing we need to understand about being moved with compassion. And, and I think it's important to understand that when somebody comes into our life with a great need, we should look at it as an opportunity, not an interruption. <laughs> now get the picture. Peter and John were on their way to pray. They were going to the Temple Mount for the hour of prayer, man, to meet with God, to fellowship with the Lord. And yet they set aside their own agenda to minister to this man. Why? Because the problem this man had was not an interruption to their life. It was an opportunity for them to exhibit compassion. And I think many of us today need to be very careful of this very thing because we get very busy. We're on a time schedule. We have places to go, people to see, and things to do. And I've got to be here. I've got to go there. I've got to do this, and I've got to take care of that, and so-and-so's waiting for me on this, and this document's got to be shipped out by noon, and, and we've got a lot of stuff going on. I get it. Believe you me. So when a problem arises, we look at it like, oh, no, I can't believe this. You know, I never, Friday's my study day. I try to study on Fridays for Sunday. And I'll hang out my little sign on my door. It says, please do not disturb. I'll check messages periodically. And I'll put my phone on do not disturb. And I'll turn off the little computer things. And, uh, and it's like I'm really not here. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, sometimes I'll even park in the upper parking lot. So when they look out, no, he's not here. No, just kidding, I don't do that. He's going, no, that's a good idea. No, I don't do that. <laughs> okay, I've done it twice. <laughs> but you know, inevitably, that's when something happens. That's when emergencies, you know, emergencies never happen from nine to five, do they? <laughs> <laughs> it always happens at the worst possible time. And for those of you who are in any kind of industry that deals with emergencies, you understand what we're talking about. And it never fails. Something will happen. And you know, I'll have that choice to make. I'll have a decision like, okay, do I just keep studying or do I try to take care of this situation? You know, and the Lord always, always just mm, puts it to me and says, Clark, you big idiot. What's more important? And you know, I'll tell you what, this is a great example for all of us. Because when somebody is in need, it shouldn't be an interruption. It should be an opportunity for us to, you know, Friday I was in the office and as I was walking through, I saw Cindy in there and, and I, I made mention, I said, Cindy, how come you're not at prayer? She goes, oh, there was an emergency. Somebody needed some help and I was dealing with that and, and, and I kind of snickered because I was studying this passage. And she goes, what? Like, should I be at prayer? Like, <laughs> I said, no, you, sh you should have done exactly what you did. And I explained about this passage we're dealing with today. But you see, that should be the heart of those who love the Lord. And here we see that example in these men. Well, let's come to a third matter. Uh, we said there were five things we wanted to look at regarding the example of these men. Number one, they were men of prayer. Number two, they were men of compassion. And number three... They were men of discernment. They were men of discernment. Look at verses five and six. 
It says, so he gave them his attention, this lame man who was looking on the ground when Peter said, look at us, and expecting to receive something from Peter and John, Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. Now get the picture. This beggar wanted money. Peter and John said, we don't have any money. Now, the reason I think that's interesting is back in verse 44 of Acts chapter 2. Take a look. In Acts chapter 2, verse 44, it says, Now all who believed were together, 3,000 of them, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and good, and divided them among all as anyone had need. Uh, turn over to chapter 4, Acts chapter 4. Uh, look at verse 34. Acts chapter 4, look at verse 34. It says, nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the feet of uh, laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as he had need. Wow. Clearly, Peter and John had money. In fact, they probably had a lot of money. 3,000 people sold all their possessions and laid the money at the feet of the apostles. And these apostles distributed funds to those who had need. This is exactly what the first century church was all about. And here is a man laying at the gate, beautiful, lame, expecting to get some help from Peter and John. I mean, after all, this is what they've been doing. And Peter and John said, oh, sorry, we don't have any money. What? Seems to me you have a lot of money. Follow me? So why did Peter say silver and gold have we none? The point is this, clearly they had a lot of silver and a lot of gold. What Peter is saying, sir, for you, we don't have silver and gold because money's not your issue. Money's not your problem. They had discernment. They discerned that this man's need was not money, it was Jesus. <laughs> what this man really needed was a healing and a touch from Jesus Christ. So they exhibited great discernment in meeting the real need of this man. And I'll tell you what, how important it is that we are discerning the true needs of people. We need to understand that just giving somebody something isn't really the solution to the problem. Oh, it might appease them for a bit and it might make us feel better about ourselves. But the truth of the matter is, we need to discern what they really need. And this is a very difficult issue because when we see people with a need, we think, oh, here's what you need to meet that need. And we look at it from strictly a physical standpoint. And it's important we take that step back and look at it from a spiritual standpoint. Maybe the reason they're in this situation is because of the spiritual depravity that's in their life. Now, I'm just saying it's important for us to exercise that gift of discernment, and clearly these men did. Now, let's come to a fourth matter. The fourth thing we learn about the example of these men, they were men of faith. They were men of faith. Look at verses 6 and 7. In the middle of verse 6, it says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Wow. Talk about faith. These guys were men of faith. And in verses 6 and 7, we see their faith manifest in two ways. First of all, by what they said. By what they said. In verse 6, Peter said, In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Now, those are some pretty bold words. According to Acts chapter 4, verse 22, this man had been lame for 40 years. Everybody knew it. And Peter, by faith, spoke the words of faith. Now, this is not a name and claim it, a blab it and grab it type of philosophy. Please don't misunderstand. But he had faith 
and his faith was seen in what he said. And I think this is important because all of us have faith. Uh, Romans 12, 3 says, God's dealt to each man a measure of faith. But the problem we often face with our faith is we look at faith quantitatively. We look at faith in light of quantity or size because after all, uh, Jesus talks about those with little faith. He talks about those who he has seen great faith in. Uh, the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. So we have a tendency to look at faith from a standpoint of size or quantity. And yet Jesus said in Matthew 17, 30, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this tree, be plucked and move it into the sea. So apparently it's not about the size of our faith. Because Jesus said, if your faith was only as big as a mustard seed, guys, you got it backwards. It's not about the size of your faith. It's about the object of your faith. Wow. Our faith is only as great as the object in which we place it. We all have the same measure of faith. The question is, where are we putting our faith? If we're putting our faith in our own abilities, our own efforts, <laughs> we're going to be faithless. But if we're putting our faith in Jesus Christ and his ability to heal this man, now we have great faith because there's no greater object in which we can place our faith in Jesus Christ. So the first way we see their faith is by what they said. But the second way we see their faith is in verse seven, it's by what they did. Peter reached down with his right hand, lifted him up, and he was healed. His faith, now don't miss this picture, his faith was put into practice. What he did was the tangible manifestation of his faith. Back to James 2.20. Faith without works is dead, yeah. We can have all the faith we want. The question is, are we exhibiting our faith? Are we manifesting our faith in not only what we say, but what we do? That's the picture of faith that's being painted here. <laughs> you know, I received a phone call from a, a guy here at the church, and he said his father was sent home for hospice care. He only had a few hours left. He, he said, Pastor, can you come over and pray with us? I'm here, my sisters, brothers, my mother, all our kid, grandkids are here, and, and my dad, you know, I mean, he, he doesn't have very long to go. Can you come pray with us? I said, sure. So I jump on my truck, and I'm heading over to their house, and about halfway there, I'm just praying. I'm saying, Lord, you know, just give me some words to comfort and uh, uh, console the family at their time of loss and grief, and I'm just asking for God's Spirit to be working and touching our hearts, and, and, and the Lord spoke to me so very clearly. It was almost audible. He said, Clark, well, he didn't say Clark. He said, <laughs> that was implied. I was the only one in the truck, so it had to be for me. <laughs> he said, this man is going to be totally healed. I mean, it was almost audible. He said, he will be totally healed. I said, really, Lord? Like, like are you sure? <laughs> it was so strong, I literally had to pull over. I had to pull over. I mean, I was so shaken by this. I thought, wow, and I just prayed. I was just praying in the spirit and crying out to God like, <laughs> wow. And I get to the guy's house and I'm up to the front door and right as I'm ready to knock and I hear the Lord speak to me again, he's gonna be totally healed. Whew. I knock on the door, they answer, oh, pastor, we're so glad you're here and we were hugging and crying and they said, come on in, you know, can you pray for our daddies in the bedroom and, you know, and the nurses in there and all the grandkids and the whole family. I said, okay, so we're all standing, true story, we're all standing around this guy's bed and, and I'm just so convicted by the spirit because God told me he would be healed and I had a choice to make. I could just say nothing or I can speak the word of faith that God gave me. And I'll never forget, I, I was struggling so, because I mean, here he is laying right in front of me. He's not going to make it another hour or two, you follow? And all of a sudden I said, God said he's going to be totally healed. And I can almost see the words coming out of my mouth. You know, I wanted to bring him back, but it was too late. I said it. I said it. And the whole family, they start smiling and laughing. They're going, oh, praise God, Pastor. This is a word from God. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, what did I do? 
So I reach down and I grab him and he's in my arms and I'm praying for him. I'm just pouring on my heart to God. And, and right in the middle of this prayer, we hear this. <gasps> and that was it, man. He died right in my arms. I open one eye, I'm looking around. <laughs> And the family, they start smiling and rejoicing. They said, Pastor, you were right. God totally healed our father. And I thought, <laughs> You see, I was thinking physically. God was speaking spiritually. Wow. Oh, me of little faith. <laughs> I had the right message. I just didn't have the right understanding. A couple weeks later, I was speaking at the men's conference and Friday night, we opened up the pulpit for men who need prayer. Maybe they need a, a touch spiritually healing for their family or physical healing and the pastors are up and had a fella come up to me and uh, I shared that story with them and, and he came up, he said, Pastor, you know, I've got this physical problem and, and can, you pray that, can you pray that God heals me? He said, but don't pray for a total healing. <laughs> 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 Number five. The fifth and final thing we would note here real quickly is these men were ready. These men were ready. I think in verses one through seven in Acts three, we see they were now ready. On a previous occasion in Matthew 17, verses 14 through 21, a man had brought his epileptic son, demon possessed to the disciples. They couldn't heal him. And Jesus said, oh, ye of little faith, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? They said, well, why couldn't we cast out this demon? Jesus said in Matthew 17, 21, this one only comes out by prayer and fasting. And I can just see the disciples in Matthew 17 saying, well, Lord, you know, we really didn't have time to pray and fast. This guy came out of the blue and, you know, we weren't ready. And, but here, these guys are ready. They were ready for whatever life threw their way. Why? because they were filled with God's Holy Spirit. And you know, when we're filled with the Spirit, when we're walking in the Spirit, relying on the Spirit, we're gonna be ready. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 4.2, we're to be ready in season and out of season. 1 Peter 3.15 says to always be ready to give that answer. Look, it's about being prepared for what God brings our way. Well, back to Acts chapter three, real quickly. Let's come to the third and final thing in light of this miracle. We said the miracle did three things. Number one, it substantiates Peter's teaching. Number two, it sets an example for us today. And number three, and finally, it stirred the heart of those at the temple. That's in verses eight through 11. It stirred the heart of those at the temple. Now, the first heart that was stirred, of course, is the lame man, and it resulted in him praising God. Look at verses eight and nine. In verse eight of Acts three, it says, so he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. This man's heart was stirred to a point where he was praising God. No doubt for the physical healing, no question about that. But I have to believe it also includes the fact that he realized his healing was a work of God's Messiah. Because in Isaiah 35, 6, the Bible says, the lame shall leap like a deer. So he was no doubt praising God for the coming of the Messiah. How? Through pre Peter's preaching, teaching Jesus is the Christ. Now, the second heart that was stirred in verses 10, 11 are the people. And we see their heart was stirred to a point where they were amazed with God. Now look at verses 10 and 11. In verse 10, it says, then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. Twice we're told that the people were amazed with God. And their, their amazement with God is probably because they thought that the kingdom of God was now at hand. 
because Isaiah 35 is coming to fruition, that when the Messiah comes, the lame shall leap like deer. Back to Isaiah 61, the coming of the Messiah. He's going to bring, you know, heal the brokenhearted, and he's going to bring vision to the, it's just miraculous time. And they no doubt equated that with the kingdom of God. Therefore, they were amazed with God. Now, we know that Jesus Christ did not come to heal all physically, but he did come to heal all spiritually. And before we give our life to Jesus Christ, before we ask him to be our Lord and Savior, we, like this lame man, well, we're in great need. And Jesus Christ has come, moved with compassion toward those who are lame, those who are dead spiritually, we might say, as he is reaching out his right hand and saying, I don't have silver and gold, but what I have, I give to you. I can heal you eternally. I can save you practically. And that's what Jesus Christ desires to do to all of us personally. And as we bow our hearts and our heads to the Lord, I guess the question for each and every one of us is very simple. Have you reached out to the hand of Jesus? Have you accepted his offer of healing, his touch? You see, this lame man represents all of us before we came to faith in Christ. We're hopeless, we're helpless. There's no way we can <laughs> do anything. But Jesus recognizes he had discernment regarding that need, if you will. And he came moved with compassion so that we might be healed. He can heal the brokenhearted. He brings life to those who have none. He guarantees us an eternal spot in heaven with him. And you know, all we have to do is reach out. All we have to do is take his hand. Jesus said, come, come unto me. All ye who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest for your soul. Only Jesus Christ can give us that rest, that peace, that eternal life. And all you have to do is say yes. And if you're here today, and if you want to be rescued from sin, death, and hell, if you want to be guaranteed eternal life, man, maybe you've walked away from God. Maybe you need to get right with God. Or maybe you've never, ever given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, wherever you're at today, whatever the circumstances are, he's reaching out to you. And all you have to do is say yes. If that's your heart, I want to pray for you right where you're seated. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is say yes. If you want to be guaranteed eternal life, you just let me pray for you right here, right now. You slip up your hand so I can see it. Just between us here, right now. Man, don't put this decision off another day. Maybe God's been tugging on your heart and, and you've just been kind of vacillating between what's right and what's needed. Maybe you're out on the patio. Maybe you're in the overflow or maybe you're right here in the sanctuary. Look, wherever you're at, you just let me pray for you right here, right now. If that's your heart, if that's your desire. Father, we do thank you. Lord, we thank you for your healing hand that heals us spiritually. Lord, that touches us, that fills us, that enables and empowers us to have eternal life in you. And Lord, we just can't even begin to comprehend the depth of your love. Father, you're so faithful in meeting our need according to your riches and glory. And Lord, I just thank you. Thank you for the eternal life that you've granted to each and every one of us. 
And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for anything at all, after service, the pastors will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you. And I do pray that God would continue to touch your hearts, bless your lives. He would continue to pour his spirit out in a very real and powerful way. That as you go forth in this new week, man, you just fall more in love with Jesus. And he would do a great and mighty work in each and every one of your lives. God bless you guys. I love you much. Have a, have a great week in the Lord.